morning. Welcome. My name is Bob Rieker. I am the current NATA president-elect, and today's free workshop is sponsored by the Nebraska Art Teachers Association. A couple of housekeeping things. Please be sure that you do mute yourself uh, unless you are speaking. That way we can avoid uh, background, no background noise. And then please note that we are recording this today uh, for the NATA a YouTube channel that will be posted sometime probably this week when I get a chance to download it and upload it into the uh, NATA YouTube channel. Um, all of our presenters have agreed to uh, for us to record this. Uh, if you are not comfortable with having your face um, on screen, we certainly encourage you to mute your uh, picture. Uh, as we know, sometimes privacy uh, is something that you would like to not have your face out there or your name out there. So uh, welcome. So um, I've welcomed you, but now um, I would like to introduce Amber Kosmicki. Uh, she is our current NATA K-12 liaison. Hello, Amber. Well, good morning and welcome attendees. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Amber Kosmicki and I teach K-12 art at Wilcox Hillerith Public Schools. We are thrilled to have you join us this morning to learn and create. And we have a robust plan for today with some outstanding presenters. Those of us that teach K-12 or multi-levels have unique requirements and needs, so we hope that today addresses that situation in your journey as an art educator. So if you will take a moment and open up your chat and introduce yourself, please include your name, your location, and your position in art education. And to help you, those items are in the lower left-hand corner because I know many of us are both visual and auditory learners. So thought it would be helpful to have both of those items on there. Bob, do you have the option on for us to see each other's posts? Because right now mine's only letting me type to you directly. You know what? <laughs> that is a good question. And I'm sure you'd be thrilled to receive that message, but you might already know all of this. It's all coming through there. So I'm not sure, let's see. Uh, participants can chat with, oh, there we go. Everyone publicly, there we go. So if you already put your name in, would you do it again? I apologize. Thank you, Jen Bacherman for pointing that out. My, my apologies. There we go. Are we starting to see him now? <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, as I told uh, the presenters a couple days ago, we have people from uh, who registered in many, many different states. Uh, I, I believe we have uh, we we had people register from Oklahoma. We of course have uh, Michiganders with us. Um, as you look through, of course, Nebraska, which we assumed, uh, Texas, of course. But you can kind of look through and see if anybody from your state is joining us today. Uh, you may know somebody and not realize that uh, they were joining us today. So let's give you uh, another 30 seconds or so. Continue to populate your name, location, position. All right, very good. Well, we wanna welcome everyone. Thank you for going in and letting us know um, who you are, where you're at, what you teach or what, what, what role you have in uh, art education. Um, I will be keeping an eye on the chat today. So as issues come up, needs come up, questions come up, please put those uh, in the chat. Um, and certainly our presenters are gonna offer some time for some Q and A as they will share here uh, very shortly. So Amber, thank you so much for introducing uh, today and welcoming uh, people to this. We're really glad. Um, we do have a very robust agenda as Amber uh, shared uh, briefly. Um, so just to let you uh, know if you forgot what our plan looks like for today, uh, we're taking care of welcome and introductions. Uh, we're starting off today with our two presenters from Michigan uh, to provide about an hour's worth of time uh, to really delve into those issues that are related to multi-level teachers. And so uh, we're, we're excited to hear their presentation. We will plan to take a break approximately 15 minutes between 11 and 11.15. When we come back, uh, we'll be joined by Casey Conley, 
who teaches uh, here in Lincoln. And I know that she's worked closely with Jen Bacherman and both uh, Jen and Casey serve on our board as directors. So I'm sure all that will be shared as we introduce. Um, and then this, there's two parts to that. So you'll get an opportunity to get a little hands on this morning as well. Uh, very happy that Shelby Ricks then will join us for our closure at the end. And then of course, I will finish up with uh, thank yous. Um, we do wanna congratulate we had our first 10 registrants from Nebraska who received a materials packet from NATA. If you were one of those people, raise your hand, unmute yourself and shout, whatever, however you would like to show off yourself. We'd love to know if you were one of those uh, receivers. And shout out, of course, to Jen Bacherman. She was the one that uh, coordinated that effort to get those. Oh, good. I see a couple of you are holding up. Hold that up. If you have your materials, hold them up so we can see. Hey, Jan, do you want to unmute yourself and just share briefly? What is it that you sent out to our 10 registrants? We sent out a travel watercolor kit that you can take with you wherever you go. It is pocket size and it comes with a, a brush that I think holds the water right in it. And also some of the, yep, there we go. Melanie's holding it up. Yeah. Um, and it comes with um, some thick heavyweight watercolor paper. I think 90 pound watercolor paper along with that, some sheets of it to already pre-cut to size for your classroom to use. And Jen, I love the fact that uh, you had actually, you recommended this because you were, you had used it before and you thought it was just such an outstanding tool to you. So. Yes, I loved it. Found it uh, at a conference in New York. Everybody had one and I didn't. And that's, I immediately went and got one. <laughs> hey Jen, if you have an opportunity, can you pull up any specs on that so that way our people who did not receive one of those might be able to have it. Um, yep. And if you can't find it right now, just share it with me and then I'll put it in the thank you later on that we send out to everybody. Thank you so much, Jen. Appreciate it. Well, um, Rebecca Jorgensen, who serves on our board as the professional learning director, had hoped to join us today, but uh, she is a very busy mother and she told me she is out chauffeuring children to different events uh, this morning. So unfortunately, Rebecca could not join us. She may join us as a participant at some point. Um, so because she cannot introduce, I am going to proudly introduce um, our two presenters uh, to get us started here uh, for our first section. Um, one of the goals of NATA is to provide opportunities for Nebraska art educators to learn and grow as professionals. And of course, this is, is an example of that where we've even broadened it open to uh, people all across uh, the United States. Uh, today's presentation, we hope will do just that for you to help you to both learn and grow. I am very proud to introduce uh, Carrie Jerusal and Darcy Schreiber from Michigan. Uh, both of them are K-12 art educators um, and they both came highly, highly recommended uh, when I put out a call a few months ago saying, we're looking for dynamic, wonderful, incredible K-12 art educators who would be able to present a message uh, to people who would be joining us this morning. So I'm going to turn this over to Carrie and Darcy, our featured speakers for today, and I'm going to stop my share. That way they can do that. So look at all these faces. Hey, before you share, I'm going to take a screenshot. This is awesome. Everybody smile. Awesome. Okay. Darcy, share, please. Good morning, everyone. I know that Carrie and I are both so excited to be here and to talk about some of the challenges in working with um, K through 12 art education. So like the K through 12 art conundrum, how do you manage this? Um, <laughs> how are you using your time and uh, feeling the burn and maybe some suggestions and things that uh, we have that we have both implemented in our programs to make it a little bit easier. I have forgotten how to do a Zoom. It's been a while. We're face-to-face -face here in Michigan and uh, we're not doing that much right now in where I live. Um, so I think I skipped it. Maybe I didn't skip a slide, nope. So I am Darcy Schreiber. I live in Pickford, Michigan, um, which if you're thinking of the glove, yes, we use our hand to uh, kind of see where we're at, but I'm not in the glove. I'm up above in uh, the part of Michigan. Um, right above the bridge that connects our lower half of our state to the upper half. So I'm in the upper half. Um, we're quite Northern up here. I am really passionate about rural arts education, 
But interestingly, I didn't grow up here. I grew up in the Metro Detroit area. So I am sort of a long way from my roots. And it took me a little while to figure out um, how to teach to a population that maybe I didn't necessarily grow up and be a part of. Um, and where I live, um, the family names around here have been in this area for generations. So it um, has some challenges in and of itself. I'm also a liaison for the Michigan Art Ed Association and a liaison for Region 1618, which is the entire um, Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And even though um, we are kind of scattered about the Upper Peninsula as art teachers, I really am passionate about trying to mentor and connect with and make deep connections with my educators up here as part of um, the liaison role that I play. Um, I'm gonna let Carrie kind of introduce herself here. Hi everyone, um, I'm Carrie DeRuzel and um, I teach in the Lower Peninsula. Darcy didn't say the word, but she's a youper. That's what person from the UP, well, kind of a youper. Not, because I didn't grow, I'm a now. transported troll. I'm, I'm oh. a troll that now has lives in the, because <laughs> we go by the bridge, so I'm, yeah. <laughs> Got it, so some Michigan stuff there. But um, yeah, teaching K-12 is definitely a unique situation. And I'm so glad that we have this opportunity to share with you guys today about the unique um, challenges, but also opportunities that being a K-12 teacher offers. Um, I just listed there some of my career highlights, but I've been teaching since 2001. So this is my year 20. Um, and I've been teaching specifically K-12 for about 15 years now. Um, I started off in uh, teaching for a private school and I teach in a public school now. And I've taught um, kindergarten all the way through um, the college level at Hope College in uh, Holland, Michigan. So um, we're just really excited to share with you guys kind of like a fire hose worth of, worth of information and then maybe do some focusing um, later on when we have some questioning and answer. So we're going to open up with just thinking about um, the logistics of 12 K through 12 teaching. And we are all presented with challenges in this role. And I just want to kind of highlight some of those to get you thinking about them. Um, because I know these are things that you are also facing. So, and I feel like some of it has been really apparent within this last year with the pandemic and how all of our roles um, have changed a bit and how we're adopting technology. But what really became apparent to me is the technology inequity that my students have in living in the remote area that we do. Um, not all of them have internet service and um, that's hard to imagine now, but it, it really was something that as a district we faced and that we had to come up with a plan to address. Um, distance and geographical location is a challenge for us um, as well. And weather, we have <laughs> weather um, inequ like snow days, ice days, um, things that make it very challenging for kids to get to school, lack of transportation. A lot of times our students are very isolated even from other students in their age group. Um, or like when they meet for a bus, they have to go to a central stop rather than one that picks them up directly at their house. And even just getting to their stop can be challenging for them. Um, educator retention, I think, is a national crisis at this moment, not just one that is unique to rural schools, but um, for us, it's very hard to find teachers to come to our rural area that maybe only has two restaurants and not even a stoplight, <laughs> a blinking yellow light. So um, what are we doing to attract these people, high quality educator educators who are engaging? Um, that's been an issue for us. And then funding. My school that I currently work at um, has only had an arts program for the last six years. And that was a challenge that I decided that I would undertake. Um, before that, there was no visual arts program. And um, it became apparent to the administrator here that that was something she really wanted for her students. Lack of economic economic opportunity within the community that fosters connectedness was something that I was thinking, um, my students are where we live, they don't really see the arts and the broad culture. There aren't museums, um, things that they go to, shows or musicals. 
Um, we don't ha even have a movie theater. So sometimes it's difficult for them to understand that there are career opportunities in the arts and this is a viable thing that they can study and um, have a career path. So I feel like sometimes that connectedness to the arts in and of itself in the community is something that um, we struggle with as K through 12 art educators in a rural area. Lastly, I love this. I don't know if you've seen this humorous quote before um, where it says, I've always loved art teachers because they were so bizarre. They were like the homeless people of the faculty, all disheveled, wearing smocks, covered in paint, always digging through the garbage, looking for bottles and egg cartons and things. I love this quote because it really demonstrates um, you know, I, I like to think I'm a bit more professional, but I know there's sometimes a misunderstanding of what it is that we are exactly doing in teaching. <laughs> um, <laughs> so as a faculty member in a K through 12 school, I am the only art teacher. Um, so sometimes there's a little bit of misunderstanding of what it is that we are exactly doing. So I'm going to talk a little right bit about like where I'm coming from. Um, uh, my particular situation um, is it's a K-12 building. Like our whole school is under 300 students and we all fit in one building. Um, and we have like one end that's the secondary building. We have the gym and the office and then we have the elementary wing. Um, and so my students all travel down to the secondary wing where my classroom is. Um, we only have two administrators. Um, my town specifically, um, it shrinks and then in the summer it blows up because we're right on Lake Michigan. Um, in fact, a lot of people call Pentwater where I teach um, Little Chicago because you could walk down uh, downtown villi the village of Pentwater and like never see anybody that you know because it's all people from Chicago, Detroit and Lansing who have their lake houses and their cottages here. So um, the summer industry of tourism is really, really important. Like all our kids have summer jobs. A lot of our um, parents and families um, run tourist tourism based businesses. Um, and so that's a really interesting and unique part about our population. Um, our families don't take vacations in the summer. Our families take vacations in the winter. So it's not uncommon to have students like a whole family gone for a week or two in the middle of February, um, because that's when their family, when their parents um, can take vacation. So there's just like unique things like that. We're um, not really known for our diversity. You can see our statistics there. Um, it is um, mostly um, a Caucasian school. We um, have a diversity in economics, I would say. That's where we really have our diversity. So even though we have like all these um, wealthy people and retirees who live here in the summertime, when they all go home, um, the people who are here year round um, are not the rich people. And our students, um, a lot of them struggle. So we have 68% free and reduced lunch. We're an at-risk school, we're Title I. Um, and I am the art department, which I'm assuming that many of you who tuned in today are as well. Um, so when people talk about, you know, their department, I am the department. I, you know, I teach everybody and um, we, you know, we'll be talking about different advantages that come along with that, but it's also a lot of work. I typically describe my job as, you know, it's not just one teaching job, it's like 10 teaching jobs um, all rolled into one. And um, I, I also describe my job as like, it's never boring. It's never, never boring. <laughs> so um, advantage or disadvantage, it is never boring. Um, I should also say that my class sizes, um, logistically, my class size runs anywhere from seven students, which is one of my high school classes, um, which is very small, obviously, to 23 students. Um, and then I do some things uh, once in a while where I'll mix uh, grade levels and have, you know, a whole room full of 50 kids. But um, typically each day I can have anywhere from seven to 23. Um, and then, of course, I do National Honor Society, um, Spanish and Art Club with the Spanish teacher across the hall. And I'm even uh, involved in Girl Scouts. So it mixed in with the kids in a lot of different ways. Next slide. 
So I often also describe my schedule as too complicated to really say in words. I always say I need to draw you a picture of my schedule because it's so complicated and the way that um, everything comes together is um, also complicated and it changes. Um, and of course now with um, our hybrid schedule, it's changed even uh, again. So um, when I teach, I, I am not a one methods kind of teacher. Um, I pull from lots of different methods. And so um, I would say that I pull mostly from like big idea method or theme method, um, but I also do uh, curriculum based on uh, children's literature, um, which we used to call story stretchers, if anybody remembers that back in the day. Um, I still have a couple good old lessons from discipline based art ed. Um, I still um, try to incorporate ideas of STEAM. I have some really strong STEAM lessons that I repeat year after year with my seventh graders. Um, and I also do a little bit of choice based here and there. I'm not like a diehard tab teacher. I won't claim to be that. But I will also say that um, a lot of my K-12 lessons are service based. So service based our education is also something that I do. So my courses are for the full year. And if I start with high school and I describe my high school curriculum, my high school curriculum is a curriculum that rotates every um, three years. And if you wanted to take uh, art four years, then your fourth year in high school would be like an independent course, typically reserved for seniors. Um, so when I first got the job of teaching high school, I was under the impression that everybody did like basic art and then advanced art. And you kind of like went up um, through the stages like that. Well, because my students can take um, this class any um, year that they want to, I have kids that come into the class with, you know, four years of experience. And I have kids that come into the class with zero years of experience. And so I've had to change my curriculum to be on a rotation. So my rotation that I do, like um, I'll start with two dimensional art education with this, which is um, drawing, painting, printmaking. And then the next year I'll do 3D art and we'll focus more on sculpture and ceramics and fibers. And then my favorite curriculum that I teach is um, based on contemporary art in art careers. Um, and then, so each year a kid takes the class, it's going to be a new curriculum. So they'll learn something new. Um, and I differentiate between the students who have more experience and those who don't. Um, and then my middle school is um, not a four grade mix, it's a three grade mix. So it's sixth graders through eighth graders. And so that is not as, um, uh, set in stone because they're not earning a high school credit. And if, you know, you have to get a high school credit, it has to be much more specific. So that one you can see is just more of an art survey that repeats A, B, and C every three years. So it's complicated. Got <laughs> to map it out. Next slide. Um, elementary, or, or I should mention that seventh grade, um, my administration um, forces are eighth graders to take Spanish. And so because the eighth graders are forced to take Spanish to get their Spanish credit for high school, the seventh graders are forced to take art. <laughs> so that was kind of the trade off. And so seventh grade is the only class that I get that I teach the same curriculum every year. It's the only one that I get new kids, new curriculum or the same curriculum each year. Elementary um, is a little bit more crazy. So I will have one day where I'll have two elementary classes and I will couple them kind of by grade level. So kindergarten and first, second and third, fourth and fifth. And then I see them, um, as you can see here, sometimes twice a week and fourth and fifth only once a week. So they get less, obviously. Um, and I try to mix up the uh, benchmarks and state requirements so that sometimes they're getting their grade level, sometimes they're getting the grade level that's next to them. So by the time they are through elementary, I'll have hit all of the benchmarks, but not necessarily when they're in that grade level, if that makes any sense. Um, and I found that this is great 
uh, for storage, for supplies, and for my own sanity. Because when I first started out and I was trying to do something different with kindergarten and get different with first and second and third, and everybody was doing something different and I was trying to keep it all um, separate and uh, it just didn't work. So this is how I have um, managed um, elementary curriculum. And if you're a person who teaches um, elementary, I would give this a shot because it <laughs> really, for your own sanity, for storage, for your budget, um, it has really worked well for me. Next slide. So this is where um, I'm gonna take over a bit and just give you the demographics of my school. So I am way up north, as I had mentioned before, um, and grew up in the Detroit area. So a long way from where I really grew up. Um, but I really love my rural area now. I can't imagine really teaching anywhere else. But my school, um, we are kind of sandwiched in between Sault Ste. Marie, which is like the hub to Canada there and the Sioux Locks and um, St. Ignace, which is like on the other side of the UP. So I'm kind of on the Eastern end here. Um, I have 443 students. We have a large native American population up here and about 23% of our students at our school are native American. Um, interestingly, the school that I taught at prior to where I'm at now was a um, Anishinaabe school for cu school culture and language. Um, so, but we still, um, the tribe really helps out throughout the Eastern area of the Upper Peninsula as they're scattered throughout. Um, mostly our population is Caucasian within our school. We have a large free and reduced lunch um, and we are a title one and at risk school as well. Our community sources of income are agriculture and tourism, and we have a prison facility up here, and many of our families work within that prison facility. Um, interestingly, my school is growing exponentially, and we just seem to be getting lots more families and students um, to our area. And I think within the last two years, we've increased our enrollment by 150 students. So we are getting a lot and we are um, actually ad adding on to our school this year. So life is about to get really interesting. <laughs> um, so here's just some pictures from our area, um, living where I'm at now, like the community is very, very supportive and students are really at the heart of our community. Um, they're very well loved. I can't say that I'm ever lacking for volunteers to my classroom. Um, so very supportive of the kids in our community. So my schedule and rotations are very similar to Carrie. Um, however, and I do rotate my curriculum, I also have <laughs> been teaching technology for the last five years. So not only am I teaching art, um, I am teaching elementary technology and middle school computer science. So my schedule has changed every single year for the last six years, depending on um, our enrollment needs. So this year I have a lot more elementary classes. Um, they get art once a week for 50 minutes. I have one high school visual art course, a computer science course, elementary technology for second through fifth grade and a middle school art course. Um, for students who are not enrolled in band and they are seventh and eighth graders. Um, they have art for one semester. So we, I'm just getting a new group this coming week. That should be really exciting. <laughs> so this has been extremely challenging for me, especially because my high school courses have varied. I have a graphic design and photography background. Um, so I have taught interactive media, video publication, your book publications, and of course, also visual art. So this has always been changing um, depending upon the year. But I do rotate my curriculum like Carrie because I have in my high school visual arts course, I have students who are just starting and students who have been taking art for the last four years and maybe are on track to maybe study art in college. So um, yes, I also have to rotate my curriculum. Another way that I handle this is I like to integrate big ideas and studio habits of mind. 
for me, um, it really helps me create topics that I can engage with students all throughout K through 12. Okay, so I will use these um, to design my essential questions. And I'm hoping that in doing this, I can share some resources with you. In the slideshow, there are links to um, a Google Drive where um, you will be able to also find resources that you are welcome to use. Okay? So for example, one of my big ideas might be transformation. Um, on a K through two level, how can mistakes help us learn and grow? I've also taken that question also throughout my, I don't know, all K through 12, because I don't know about you, but when kids get about to sixth grade through 12th grade, they're feeling really conscious of their art making skills. And uh, sometimes that takes them away from actually studying art. So we've actually uh, done this lesson probably through 12th grade where we're looking at the beautiful oops and kind of talking about mistakes and you know how sometimes those mistakes lead us to more interesting conclusions. Um, I love doing this lesson through with K through two, especially second graders. They really seem to embrace that idea. And I love it then when they're third graders and I still see them, you know, taking something that that was a mistake and changing it. Um, it's just one of the wonderful things that we can do as art teachers. Um, transformation in place. What are the effects of humans on nature and how does nature transform and shape human experiences? Since I also teach technology, um, I sometimes use this as an opportunity for digital, digital storytelling and um, either having students illustrate a digital story or having them take photos and um, create their digital story that way. So I try to, because I teach both, really show um, how the arts intermix with technology. Um, and I really find that helpful for me as a teacher to kind of communicate our experiences through tech. Lastly, high school, middle school, um, how does connecting real life objects enhance the concept of transformation? Why do artists invent tools, techniques, and processes to help them create? And how does transforming something change or create new meaning? So this is, um, these questions for high school, middle school, because I do see them every day, I will often do around the room activities and I'll show you just a sample of that um, to help them engage in these concepts and you know, create connection with them. Um, so I feel like a lot of these activities could be modified for younger ages. It just gives your students a chance to engage with the art process and make connections, exploring their materials. Um, I often find I'm not a tab teacher, but I try to integrate choice for student voice and expression as much as possible. But a lot of times some students really need some scaffolding, especially with my school experience, the kids didn't have visual art for a long time. So um, they didn't have the confidence to really create their ideas for a while. Um, and now I'm seeing you know, that improve. But I'm gonna go ahead and show you um, just some of the around the room activities. Oh, make a copy. Uh, let me see if I can, oh, there it goes. Are you able to see the new slideshow? Yes. Okay, thank you. So this is really um, a cut and dry presentation and it doesn't have fancy bells and whistles because a lot of times I would just take these slides and print them out and use them at different stations and tables. Um, some of the activities are just looking at those artist studio habits of mine, like stretch and explore, and they would be going through a process and engaging that. Um, this one uses tissue paper, like the bleeding tissue paper, spraying it, laying it down, letting it dry, and the next day looking at the results and then transforming it into something new. So engaging with that process of actually transforming something from something unexpected. Um, so I have lots of activities like this. This they were looking at um, where it's stretch and explore. They were looking at different settings of places and imagining what they might look like 150 years from now, or maybe even further 500 years from now. Um, what will change, what will remain the same, sketch an idea, what is still connecting to that original place. So I'll have a variety of activities that students are going through as they're 
um, investigating the big idea. Some of these connect to things that they love, like uh, this is engaging with Sid's house from Toy Story. Um, he was a creative madman, evil genius with those toys. So even engaging with toys, um, creating three, like taking three and then creating a new toy out of the, the idea of mixing and matching, um, being a Sid really. <laughs> Um, action verbs, we look at Richard Serra's action verbs, which I talk about later in the presentation. Um, and then connecting with some artists um, who are using transformation in their work, like Cindy Sherman, um, Alexis Diaz. So you are welcome to look through these, use them, um, maybe to create some of your own around the room activities. And as a K through 12 teacher, um, it really allows the opportunity for not only my middle school students to engage in similar resources and discussion, but seeing what maybe a older student did in response to that. So across the board, it can create some really dynamic and interesting conversations. Let me see if I can get back to our other presentation here. <laughs> Okay, are we back now? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, I think now Carrie and I are going to look a little bit more deeply into um, things that you can integrate into your curriculum that offer collaborative opportunities for students. All right, next slide, please. Okay, um, wow, that's more blurry than I thought it would be. But um, I'm gonna talk about, just like Darcy said, the one of the advantages of teaching in a K-12 building or teaching a K-12 uh, population is that you can design your curriculum or your learning so that kids can work together um, and that like the whole school can have a common goal or common um, you know, essential questions and objectives. So uh, this is a uh, lesson that I um, developed that was inspired by Korean art. Um, and it was based on these pieces of fabric. You can see the example in the corner there that are called bojagi that are wrapping um, fabrics. And so in Korean culture, uh, these wrapping fabrics, these bojagi, are created um, typically uh, historically from uh, scrap pieces of fabric um, by, you know, nameless women artists, and they would be used to wrap just about anything that you can think of. They would wrap gifts. Um, the, you would wrap food with them. You know, this was pre um, tin foil or plastic wrap. Um, people would wrap. Uh, you know, parts of uh, furniture that they would set away for the summer, or, you know, they would wrap just about, you know, anything that you would have to store would have its own um, wrapping cloth to go with it. And for this unit, I collaborated with um, a author who wrote an elementary a children's story um, called Good Fortune in a Wrapping Cloth. And she sent me her book and I read her book and I used that as kind of like a springboard for this K-12 lesson where each student in the school had the opportunity to make a small self-portrait painting on a piece of masonite. So it was, it was small, it um, was almost like ornament size. And then they also had the opportunity to learn about Korean culture and learn about this um, uh, tradition of bojagi. And so they created their own. Um, and then they were, uh, they could take their self portrait that they made, wrap it in the bojagi, and then present it as a gift to someone. So my older students would, uh, they made, uh, they would make two, uh, one that they could um, keep, you know, for a family member, and then one we donated to um, a local um, medical care facility. So again, I'm incorporating um, the community. Again, I'm incorporating cultural art um, in lessons and also um, that service, the idea of art for service. So this is something that I had, like my older kids would help my younger students um, with uh, gluing down fabric, 
um, making fabric choices and creating these uh, flat pieces of fabric that in the end kind of look like modern paintings but then of course have a very um, like uh, traditional and practical use as well. Um, and then the older students, um, you know, middle school uh, and high school would learn um, stitching techniques, um, hand stitching, uh, but then I had uh, community members that donated fabric, that donated um, uh, sewing machines. And so we were able to use those in the classroom as well and older students would get to learn um, those techniques of fiber arts. Um, and then, you know, we kind of all got a chance to take our picture with them and gift them to people, gift them to the medical care facility. Um, and it all came together as, um, you know, this uh, K-12 common objective, common goal. Next slide, please. So here is the book, Good Fortune in a Wrapping Cloth. And it, um, through this beautiful story and beautiful illustrations, um, explains this Korean uh, tradition. Um, I also got in contact with uh, the contemporary artist, Yangmin Lee. She is a Korean textile artist who um, does workshops all over California. And um, she takes groups to Korea each year. Um, and I was able to communicate with her. She, um, just because I asked, you know, she sent me one of her uh, DVDs um, to give uh, like a tutorial on different stitching that she does. Um, and it was just a really like enriching experience for students who are in rural Michigan, who, you know, they don't really leave this village too often to learn about a place like Korea and Korean art um, and from a Korean American artist um, based out of California was a great opportunity. Oh, and we also got to do um, like a Skype interview with um, Joan Shetler, the author of Good Fortune in a Wrapping Cloth. So they got to see the, the literacy um, connections there too. Next slide. Um, another K-12 collaboration that I do, um, that I've repeated every three years um, is an Empty Bowls. Uh, collaboration. And if you don't know what empty bowls are, um, it's, it's a process that a lot of different um, places um, with access to ceramics do where you make bowls and you sell the bowls and the money from the sale of the bowls goes to help um, prevent uh, hunger. It goes to like a food bank or um, a food kitchen or something that helps um, fight hunger. And you can have a big event based around the sale of these bowls. Um, you can make them a hundred different ways. Um, and basically every three years we make these bowls and we and I change the theme and I do it K-12. So I developed a process kind of like a workshop um, atelier process where the big kids again help the little kids. And then there's a couple nights a week where the little kids can invite their parents in and then the little kids teach their parents. Um, and we have a local art center where I'll have community members come in and the kids will teach the community members how to make the bowls. Um, and we just go through this whole process. And in the end, we end up um, with anywhere from, you know, 200 to 300 bowls, just depends on the year. Um, and then we have a, a culminating event where we invite the community in and parents and students and we all come together for the sale of these bowls. And, um, you know, in turn, we help our local food pantry, which is like three blocks away from the school. Um, all the money goes directly to the food pantry. And I've done this, um, like I said, in a lot of different ways. Um, so this, you know, one theme um, that we did uh, most recently, um, just last year, actually, before the pandemic hit, um, was we did, uh, it was called Arts a la Mode. I got this idea from my um, colleague, Janine Campbell, where it was like all ice cream. Um, so that night we had, uh, we had a band concert. So we easily got our customers from the band concert to pop over to the gym and have um, ice cream in their bowl and pick out their bowl, buy their bowl. Um, and then um, another great theme that I did was all based around feminist art. Um, from the work of Judy Chicago um, called uh, The Dinner Party. And that one was much more like art-based. Uh, we didn't really um, have uh, a connection to music that time. It was more about um, celebrating um, the history of women. 
Next slide, please. And in that um, article that I wrote there for School Arts Magazine, I kind of go through the different steps that we went through. And every time we do the empty bowls, we present the bowls in a different way. And that year, um, uh, middle school and high school students got to you know, learn about the work of Judy Chicago and learn about feminist history. And then they presented them um, with these tables that they made, these three-dimensional um, like dedications or um, uh, works that were uh, based around a woman from history that they learned about. And um, so, uh, you know, and another theme that we did one year was all about the Renaissance. Um, so every three years, I kind of reinvent empty bowls so that I can get people interested in it again, and we can still make some money for the food pantry, but also learn a whole nother part of, you know, uh, K-12 art curriculum. So um, that's some of the, you know, great thing that can happen um, with a K-12, like, dive deep, you know, um, into a subject and have it be a common goal for everybody. Next slide, please. So then the pandemic hit and um, we're not probably gonna talk too much about how we're teaching through this, but I did want to mention how um, in March and April of last year, my, my thinking about being a K-12 teacher really, really changed and how I started to realize um, that I could design uh, lessons and learning units that were really family-based. So when we switched to um, like the whole online format for the end of last year, and this year we're hybrid, honestly, it changes day to day as to what we're doing. Um, we just had exams last week and I had to deliver exams remotely, face-to-face, and face to face in isolation. So honestly, it's, you know, it's insane and it's different every day, which I'm sure it is for you guys too. Um, but anyway, last year, um, I st really started to develop things that were kind of innately able to be differentiated so that a whole family could sit down with the same supplies and the same objective. Big kids could help little kids, you know, the little kids could teach the moms and dads um, and you could all explore the same problems or the same materials um, as a family. So I really went from like K-12 education to like K family education. So I just thought I would throw this in there as like a whole nother way that you can appreciate um, and approach K-12 education as well. Um, so I, I picked a couple of my examples here, um, and I also shared these on the OAT um, Facebook site um, back in the spring. But anyway, just a different way of exploring printmaking. You know, with little kids, you got your Legos. Bigger kids, you can chop up vegetables. Um, just different ways you can explore that whole idea of making prints. Um, and then the one on the right is almost like a game that you can play big kid, little kid, or parent, student, or you could even do it virtually with grandmas and grandpas through FaceTime. Um, so I just wanted to throw this in here as another way that you can approach um, you know, your outreach or in, during this pandemic time, um, how you can diversify, <laughs> I guess is the word, how you can pivot um, and try something that is like equally exciting and worthwhile. Next slide. Thanks. Just to piggyback on top of that, I, I think Carrie is raising such an important point. Um, and, and I know we're all feeling a little stressed out right now, especially thinking about our role in education. Um, and you don't often hear the positives, but the other day a parent stopped me and just said, we've been enjoying when we were all at home, we were enjoying your art activities so much. It was the break in our day that we could all sit down and do together. And it's, I think it's not often, especially when you're K through 12 and you're spread across the board that you hear those positives. So I would just encourage you all to like keep doing that hard work, even if you're not hearing it. And I think um, that sometimes as a K-12 teacher, you get forgotten in the shuffle 
and you don't hear the positives necessarily all the time from the hard work that you're doing. So um, thank you, Carrie, for sharing that. I think that was like so important to really think about the family aspect too, which I will test, touch more base on in a moment. Um, so thinking about collaborative activities and um, kind of going back to, <laughs> to Richard, Sarah, um, and things that you can do to create engagement across the board in your classroom. Um, this was an exercise um, that I started doing um, when I went through my master's program at Ohio State. Um, we were looking at those studio habits of mine, but also thinking of big ideas um, and using Richard Serra's action verbs to create new works of art and investigating process. Um, this is something that I find that all students can do, and it can be very um, free where kids are getting away from maybe like having to be fully competent at a, at a media or a technique, because really you're taking something and you're changing it. Um, sometimes I will put a twist on this lesson where I have kids create something first and then use an action verb to transform it. Um, and I did provide you, and Richard Sarah, there's a great video that is on this slide, but it's tools and strategy through the Art 21 series. Um, that I do have my high school students watch as they're going through their around the room activities. Um, but they'll use these action verbs just to create transformation. And it really gets them thinking differently about, um, you know, how small processes can really change your outcome. So I have provided you with, an, with the action list on little tabs down here. Um, if you use the file, just know it's upside down right now, but it will print correctly for you. I'm just too lazy to go in there and rotate it. It'll be okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but I have found this activity really engaging across the board. My middle schoolers love to work collaborative, collaboratively through this process. I'll give them magazines um, and then give them an action verb. They pick one and then they have to think of a way to take um, sometimes I'll give them some parameters like 50 magazine papers and have to create something or I'll give them like a, you, you have to do units of 100 or um, something challenging um, throughout that engaging that act, action verb and they oftentimes really surprise me with um, some of the sculptural things they create. Oh, I don't mean to start that video. Um, another thing that I like to do in my classroom setting, which has been a little bit different this year for me, um, is I use design thinking often, um, thinking about how design can fulfill a need. So I am really trying to do this because I want kids, I'm not necessarily producing kids that are going to be artists, but I want them to think like an artist. I want empathy to be at the heart of what they're doing um, and thinking about how design can help us shape the world. Um, so I try to walk them through these processes and even through doing small challenges, um, like creating a device powered by air, escaping from a balloon that will travel as far as it can along a stretch line um, with limited tools and materials. Um, they find these really engaging, especially if you have middle school students, um, they get really into this. And these can be modified, I find, for all age levels, um, working with different resources. There is an artist, her name is Veronica Scott, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with her story, but she created the empowerment plan, but it really started as a design thinking project. Um, she had to create a, or she created a, she had to create something that fulfilled the need. And she is an artist from Detroit. She came up with a coat that also, um, she was thinking about the homeless population. So she came up with a coat that could also be turned into a sleeping bag. It's a really powerful story. Um, because then after she created this, she was thinking about how um, can she actually take members of the community who are homeless and start producing these coats for others. So the story is really empowering in and of itself. If you have an opportunity to learn more about her, I would encourage you to. Um, but I pull these methods in just to promote um, also ideation because kids really struggle with, with ideas and forming ideas. Um, so I want to give them as many platforms as they can to like go through the idea process quickly um, and problem solve, learn from their failures and kind of revise what they're doing. Um, 
So I find that when they're in that process of collaboration, they can fail safely. Um, and they, they tend to do better when they're, when they're allowed to do that in a group. Um, Odyssey of the Mind is a great uh, source for finding design challenges. So if you are looking for more sources, I also included a cup stack challenge lesson in here. I don't know if you've ever done this one, but this is one of my favorites where they have to take rubber bands and string and um, move cups and create like a pyramid or a stack just using those materials. And they're not allowed to actually talk during the process of moving them. So they have to figure out how they can all pull these strings and grab the cups and stack them up. It's really fun. Um, keep trying to play these videos and I don't wanna play the videos. There we go. <laughs> Cardboard challenge. I, in terms of collaboration and community events, this is something that I had a lot of success with hosting as a family night at my school. Um, if you're familiar with the story of Kane's Arcade, um, Kane was a little boy in the LA area who would go to work with his dad. His dad worked in like a junkyard um, and kind of had a business and Kane would have to go to work with him. Um, there were all these boxes and Kane started creating these games or arcade like style games out of these boxes. So there's a lot of creativity, um, but nobody was coming to Kane's arcade. So a movie maker got involved, um, kind of turned this into a social media platform and Kane, I believe he raised like $240,000, some massive amount of money that's going to a scholarship fund. Um, so amazing, the whole story. But I use this as a way to kind of promote a community night where older kids can also create these arcade style games um, and invite the younger kids to play them. We've done this as like a game within our school. I've also done it as a community build night where we might have like a theme and have lots of cardboard and we have families come in and like work. They create something out of cardboard um, based on the theme, whether it's like transportation design um, or something like that. And they create these models within a certain time period. And then we'll just go around and look at them and judge them and see what they can do with cardboard and uh, it's really astonishing some of the things they create. Um, if you're, if you know, I, there's like certain tools that you can use that really make this cardboard creation easy. There's a, something called a make do kit. Um, I've linked it below for you, but what they are, are actually like little connectors that you can um, like pop into cardboard and it, it can connect them without going through like massive amounts of tape um, and they're reusable. So. If you're looking for a more sustainable way, I would um, suggest maybe investing in some of those kits if you wanna run a family or community night using cardboard. Um, it's just an awesome material because there's an abundance of it um, and we can really get creative with it. So I, I find this a really way to engage families, but my middle schoolers love making these games and they love hosting like events like this for our younger population. And then the older kids, like my high school students also get really involved in helping manage and run those events too. Okay, um, another way that I would really encourage you to think about your community at large and maybe the traditions and um, cultural connections that are already there within your community. Um, Interestingly, like I used to work at a school for Anishinaabe culture and language before I decided to take on this new role at my K through 12 school and getting an arts program started here, but we still have a lot of um, students here who are native. Um, we did something called the Shishiman and it's a snow snake race. Um, and this is a very popular winter sport. And interestingly, when I talked to the culture and language teacher at our school, he was like, well, you know, winter's really long and cold. So people need something to do. And because at first I had no idea what, what this was all about, but it, it's snow snakes are like hand whittled poles. Um, so we would have the students create these and it was a big honor to create these for the school to use in this is event. So traditionally, um, the fifth graders would make them and then the rest of the school would use these to compete in their snow snake race. Um, 
so it's also a big honor for kids to create the track to be selected to um, create this track for this event to take place. Um, so it's a test of like skill and strength and they just basically create these uh, wood burned whittled sticks and they coat them in polymer. You can put a lead weight in there, but I kind of consider that cheating. I don't know if it really is, but I was told we weren't allowed to do that. <laughs> um, they wood burn them, they paint them, they're really beautiful works. Um, and then just having that tradition, that connection of creating and making um, to create community. So for example, like where I live currently, it's only 23 miles away from Sault Ste. Marie, but um, we're a really big agriculture town and they have like a, a hay, we, we grow hay here. And um, so we have like a community festival all relating to hay. So think about like, what, what can you do in your community to connect with some of these traditions that, that are already existing? So um, when, when the pandemic's over, one of my goals is to start um, working within this community festival and really seeing like what we can do with hay. Maybe we're gonna start creating um, art or sculptural things out of hay. I don't know yet, we're, <laughs> we're not quite there, but um, you know, think about what what are the traditions of your community? What's already there and how can you engage them? Because as a school in a small rural area, you are really the hub. You are the hub um, in that community oftentimes of cultural connections or in some of your students' experiences, you are um, what art is. You kind of represent that idea. And that's a big role, but um, I think it can be made easier when we think about what's already there. Um, and kind of working with those structures to help you get your message art out there. And you might have to think a little differently, um, you know, like making things out of hay. I've never done that, but neither have the students. So it might end up wonderful or it could be terrible. I don't know yet, <laughs> but we've got a lot of it. <laughs> um, so I would just encourage you to look at your community culture as well. So um, to sum up, we started with the challenges and we'd like to end with the collaboration and advantages of being a K-12 educator. And these are just some that Darcy and I brainstormed and came up with, um, there are more, um, but you really get a chance and advantages, you really get a chance to build relationships. Um, I was so excited the year that my first class that I had in kindergarten was graduating it was like, this is the first year that I've known these kids since they were in kindergarten all the way through being a senior in my class. And so when you're with students and families that amount of time, you get the chance to really build relationships. And as we know, relationships are you know, so important in education. You have the opportunity to really do a great community outreach. Um, like Darcy said, your program, your school, your classroom really becomes a cultural hub. Um, you get to have the control. You know, if you're a control freak, this is perfect for you because you have all of the control. You are the department, um, but it's an opportunity as well for you to really explore your own vision for, for the whole school, for your whole art department. Um, I find it is an op, uh, an advantage when I'm planning field trips. Um, my school does um, interdisciplinary field trips. So when we take a field trip and we do this once a year, um, we take the entire seventh and eighth grade with us. And because it's a small school, it's a rural school, it's not an overwhelming amount of people. And so we really give um, the students like a really um, fantastic day away from school and learning and everything that is available. Um, it's an advantage for reusing um, and being economical um, and efficient with your media and your supplies. Um, everything, you know, you control the access to everything. Um, community helpers and volunteers are usually in a small school at your fingertips. Like the retirees in my village, like they want to help, like they are here to help and they want to be involved. Um, so that can be a good advantage. Um, and then also when you're writing grants and you have these great ideas and you need extra funding, when um, grant reviewers read that this is going to um, benefit an entire K-12 population and beyond, 
that's a huge bonus. That's a desirable outreach. So it moves your application right to the top. So if you haven't done any um, grant applications, um, I would really encourage you to, and also make sure that you talk about how your outreach really benefits an entire, you know, in my case, the entire village. Um, I think we're going to pause and just um, answer any questions that you guys might have from all that. <laughs> it was a lot, we know. <laughs> Very good. Um, I didn't see any questions necessarily in the chat, but this would be a great time to either put them in the chat or please unmute yourself and uh, ask. Um, you know, Darcy, Carrie shared her extracurricular uh, duties that she has because we know in rural communities or in these settings, a lot of times you'd be with limited staff, you get to pick up a lot of extra duties. Do, what, what does your situation look like in terms of extra duties? Um, tech has really been my extra duty and um, publication of the yearbook was a huge extra duty for a while. I don't currently run the yearbook. Um, I don't like teaching tech for me is like the extra duty because it is quite a bit. Um, and I also am involved in like the cybersecurity and uh, computer science aspect of our school. So we're really working hard to like uh, and also with robotics, I'm involved with that. So um, interestingly, like I don't have like, it's been interesting. I've just become a lot better at like, I've learned coding and HTML. Um, so I'm fortunate in the sense that um, I had a photography and digital design background um, prior to this and it really helped me in that sense. And I think as our teachers were sort of flexible in our thinking um, it's not hard for us to maybe like do a quick change and change our hats and take on some of those things. But um, yeah, a lot of it is tech related. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Hey, um, Marilyn uh, shared, how do school sports affect your students' involvement in art programs? Um, I would say you definitely have to make friends with the athletic director. <laughs> um, you definitely need to um, when, before I schedule anything, I have to run it through like 10 different schedules and 10 different people to make sure that there are no conflicts. And if there are conflicts, how can we work through them? It is difficult. I'm not going to sit here and say that I've got it all figured out. It is really tough. Um, especially because we're so small. We only have two gym spaces. We have what we call the big gym and the small gym. Um, and then when you are in a small school, the same kids are involved in everything. So they get exhausted, they get tired, they get pulled in a lot of different directions. Um, and so it is tough. I would, I would just say that the key is um, organization planning ahead and communication, because you're gonna ask for a million different favors from this coach and this coach and this coach. And you might as well like start, <laughs> start building those relationships with those people as well. And, you know, um, that's the only way I can do it is to compromise and to communicate. Very good. Thank you. Um, you both shared at the beginning kind of your demographics of, of uh, you know, your, 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 your students and uh, you shared with us, certainly you both are working in um, economically challenged, potentially economically challenged uh, communities, uh, but there isn't a lot of diversity when it comes to ethnicity. You've already shared with us great examples of how you're trying to bring in different cultures. Um, what has been, what has been the acceptance or the openness to children and parents and community in you offering these kinds of experiences that are very different from their own personal experiences living in Michigan? It's a tough question. Well, right now, um, I live in a very conservative community. And um, nationally, like my community was on the news uh, just for some like embarrassing behavior related to the pandemic and embarrassing responses um, and things that were a bit irresponsible from the community itself. 
Um, so when we're bringing in like diversity into the school, um, that has been difficult for my school. Um, so it's challenging. Um, I think what, what we have to really focus on is like building our rapport and, and, you know, letting parents know that we are a voice for all students, um, letting families know that we're a voice for all students. And uh, my administration has certainly been supportive of that message. Um, but some of that is, is challenging. I found one of the things that helped because my students don't often um, leave the Upper Peninsula, like many of them have not traveled outside the area. Um, so they, they don't really understand um, larger populations as a whole. So getting them out into like a more metro area, we've taken field trips to Chicago where we do a big fundraising effort um, and we're in the, we were in the middle of planning another one, but things have kind of been put on pause. Um, and that really opens their eyes where they can start to go to these cultural institutions and see some of these uh, things that maybe they didn't understand before, um, see them up close and really think about the world as a broader place. So bringing those experiences to them as much as you can and, um, you know, that I feel like that really helps too. And, and like technology has helped a ton because now we can Skype, we can, uh, or FaceTime or whatever it is that you're doing Zoom um, to meet with these people. That has really helped a lot too. Yeah, I would say um, uh, field trips, guest speakers, um, getting these kids exposed to, you know, as many different kinds of faces and viewpoints as possible. Indefinitely, um, a good tactic is start when they're little. Um, start having these conversations when they're little, start giving them um, exposure to different cultures, you know, even in kindergarten. You know, I start with, um, there's a book that we read about um, Ruby Bridges and I'll, I'll just break it down for the kindergarten and be like, can you imagine that this little girl wasn't allowed to go to school you know, and just you, if you start with them when they're young and then you, you know, broaden their horizons with these different opportunities, it definitely helps. Um, and it is tough. Like Darcy said, you're always going to have those conservative um, parents. And I'm not even going to say parents, I'm going to say board members <laughs> who are going to be um, bumps in the road. So it, it is tough, but I think, um, I think Darcy summed it up well, like it's really good to have uh, guest speakers, field trips, um, and I, I would add start when they're little. Great messages. Uh, I mean, I put in the chat, um, you are the hub of art in your community and you're, you're the cultural hub a lot of times, as well as music programs, uh, you know, theater programs. All right, folks, welcome back. Hopefully you got a little stretch, a little refreshment, whatever it is you needed to uh, get you through the next uh, about an hour and a half or so uh, together. Uh, so we wanna welcome everyone back. Uh, I hope you join me in uh, acknowledging the great time we had with Carrie and Darcy this morning as we were learning about how they address uh, K-12 and multi-level uh, needs. And I hope many of their ideas or at least some of their ideas resonated with you. Uh, but now we're going to switch just a little bit and kind of focus in on maybe a little more of a creating activity. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Bockerman from Lincoln. She is our NATA Community Director, and she will be presenting uh, our both our presenter as well as our next activity today as she and Casey have worked closely. So Jennifer, it's yours. Thank you, Bob. And are we set to share screen? I will stop share right now, you bet. Thank you, Casey's gonna take that over. Um, as Bob said, um, I work with NATA as does Casey. She's our member services director and we're both middle school teachers in Lincoln Public Schools. And Casey's gonna start us off um, to get us ready for our art making session by leading us through a social, emotional and culturally responsive teaching technique so that we're all set to go. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Jen. Um, so as Bob and Jen has introduced me, I am Casey Conley. I teach at Irving Middle School. Um, 
and I want to talk to you about some strategies that I use in my own classroom um, for social emotional learning, which ties into also culturally responsive learning um, and teaching practices. Um, many of you, especially if you are um, Nebraska residents or Nebraska art teachers, um, if you attended the um, 2019 Nebraska City Fall Conference for NATA, um, you might have, or you might remember um, Dr. Um, Donalyn Heiss, Heisey. Okay, thank you, Bob. <laughs> um, and um, Dr. Ferial Pearson. And they were both such amazing speakers. Um, I am so sorry. I did not think I would get emotional. Um, but just like with my students, I let them see my emotions because emotions are very important and expressing those in healthy ways is very important. Um, I have been going through my own journey of mental healing and health. And um, I was really struggling, really struggling um, in 2019. And so when I heard um, Dr. Heisey and Dr. Pearson um, talking about these um, different aspects of mental health and um, culturally responsive teaching practice, it really struck a chord with me. And so um, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna make sure that I can provide a safe space for my students um, so that they can um, feel safe to express who they are and um, learn some different techniques to help them when they are overwhelmed with emotions. Uh, let's see. So um, in thinking about what I wanted to do, I decided I was going to do um, daily check-ins with my students. Um, Mondays and Fridays, I kind of figured out were good ones for maybe um, asking students about what they are looking forward to, or um, maybe like what they wanted to share that they did over the weekend. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I wanted it to be more lighthearted and fun get to know yous. And so thinking through, you know, maybe it was just like, if you could have a superpower for a day, what would it be and why? You know, so just fun little things. Um, that way they can feel comfortable communicating with one another as well as practicing those communication skills um, for when we do get into some deeper conversations. Um, before we go into learning about any of these um, strategies to help us when we are feeling overwhelmed, I do an activity with my students and I tell them the importance of why we do this. So I will have them um, create a little chart, okay? And I have these four emotions on there. And um, what I do is I say, well, let's identify because these are our four root emotions. Let's identify um, how our body reacts, how our mind re might react when we are starting to feel these. Because once we are aware of what our body's doing, what our mind is doing, then we can, it's almost like a signal of, okay, I know I'm feeling this way. Now I can implement a strategy to help me out with this. Um, then I always tell them the why of why we're doing these things and how, it, um, how each strategy that we learn throughout the semester um, impacts our brain and our body. Um, and so I wanted to do a strategy with you today. Um, I always tell students that uh, self check-ins are strictly um, for you. I stand in one spot so um, they feel safe to express whatever they're feeling or wanting to do um, on their own and they don't feel like I'm prying, which is um, a tip and strategy that I got from Dr. Heisey. So thank you so much. <laughs> Um, but something that I want you to do is to, you should have 
um, a random piece of paper. Um, I also allow my students um, to, depending on the strategy, to do it digitally if they want to do it digitally. Um, but grab a random piece of paper and any type of creation tools that you would like to use. Okay. All right. In three, we have our random piece of paper. In two, you have some type of creation tool. Thanks, Bob, <laughs> Jen, um, and in one. Okay, so for today's check-in, um, we're going to do a strategy of just creating. Okay, so when we feel overwhelmed, um, depending on what that overwhelming feeling is, sometimes we just have to distract our brain from maybe any negative thoughts that we're having or even um, getting our hands to do something. And um, then I connect it back to our chart that we make, you know. Um, anyway, so what I would like you to do is you can draw um, uh, out random um, lines, shapes, colors um, and create something very abstract or you can make something very specific, okay? And what I'd like you to do is to kind of think about, okay, where am I at right now? How am I feeling? What is my body telling me? What is my thoughts telling me? Am I calm? Are my muscles relaxed? Um, am I able to focus on a thought? Do I feel my muscles tensing up or is my heartbeat going kind of fast? Once you've kind of identified where you're at, maybe how you're feeling, and if you are able to connect it to maybe something that happened um, that got you to where you're at, um, I would like you to create something to express that emotion or express how you're doing today. Okay, I'm gonna put five minutes on my timer. And then I'm also going to, and I do this in my classroom, I play instrumental music. So I'll have some music playing and um, you have five minutes to create.
Take about one more minute to wrap up your thoughts. Wrap up, wrap up your thoughts in three. Wrap up your thoughts in two. And in one. All right. So then um, after I do this with my students, um, I give them just a little bit of time to kind of Okay, we're going to now transition into our learning for the day. Um, so this is where I kind of sometimes depending on what the prompt is, I might have them take like a couple deep breaths um, that are slow, or I might say, you know, stand up, take a stretch, um, and then have them get the materials that they need if they haven't gotten it and then we go into our learning for the day. So all right, thank you so much for participating. And um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Jen. Oh, there you are. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> okay. okay, let me. There we go. Okay. Awesome. Thanks so much, Casey, for sharing that with us. It's just so important that we are comfortable creating those spaces and sharing in those spaces so that they're available to our students to reflect and process. So we really do appreciate you sharing how you implement that in your classroom. Um, today, since this is community and creating, we're gonna give you some time to create. And also if you wanna interact and talk um, during the creation time, you can, or if we notice that it's pretty quiet and people are focusing on their projects, um, Bob has offered to play some music in the background. Um, but we're going to leave the project fairly open today, knowing that some of you might have projects already or concepts that you're working with already, but we'll also provide a prompt um, if you would like. Um, so we're going to start the project and we'll do a couple reflection questions that we would ask students throughout the process. And then at the end, as you're finishing up your projects, we're going to share out some different ways that you could adapt this project to um, a multi-level school setting with a lot of different options um, and a lot of different resources that you could use. So we are going to be uh, working with square pieces of paper. You might want to use um, different sizes with different grade bands, um, but today any size square paper will work um, because then we'll be um, have some unity in what we can do in combining those pieces together later on. So we've got a couple artists here. You're going to be able to use any media that you have at home, any style that you'd like. And we've got a couple artists who are currently working with the topic of the pandemic that's going on. We, this touches all of us. And so um, providing that place and space for students, this might be one option for this project. How are you feeling or what are you dealing with or what story or narrative do you want to tell about your life dur during the pandemic? It could be something like this piece um, from Sayas. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, where we have imagery that we recognize, there's some uh, realistic work, there's um, mixed media, or on the next slide, um, 
we've got an internationally known artist, Monique Martin, um, who's working with, she's doing these little um, collages every once in a while based on mood. And she's actually leaving the square, but she still has that square. And so that option of bringing in mixed media, collage, ink, um, magazine pages, and then also co a combination of um, what does it mean to combine these different objects? So depending on where your students at and what creative thinking strategies you might be using, how could you bring in collage and objects and what do those objects mean, especially in combination with each other? So we wanted to leave it really open for you today so that you have some time to make and create. The only requirement was that you had to have that square um, is the only limitation. Um, but if you did want to follow a prompt, do we have that? screen there. There we go. Create an artwork representing your story of the pandemic. It could be abstract. It could be realistic. It could be multimedia. Um, and in at the end, we'll be pulling together. Um, I'll have a folder that you can drop these in and that we can piece together for the um, project if you'd like to use that in your multi-level great uh, schools. So we've got some work time now. I've got my square paper in front of as you're continuing to work on your art piece, I'm going to ask that Casey share our slides again, and I'm going to um, go over how you might use this in your multi-level schools. Another prompt that I might use as students are, are working, I might have them pause and share their work with table teammates and maybe do a Harvard Project Zero Thinking strategy. What do you see? What do you think? What do you wonder? And I like to do these um, collaborative reflections before they're done so that with their artworks, the students do have an opportunity to make any changes or adjustments or, oh, maybe this piece isn't communicating my mood um, quite yet. Maybe I shouldn't be using bright yellow to show that I'm really, really down and sad. <laughs> maybe, maybe I need to add some dark blues or um, just so they have that time to get some peer feedback and still have time to make some alterations or additions. Um, so as you guys are finishing up, um, and Casey and I will make this available, um, she does a great, amazing job <laughs> with slides she uses. I'm sure she'll get lots of questions, but she does use PictoChart and then somehow magically got this into a Google Slides. And that, I, I, if you have questions, you'll have to refer those to her. She's the tech wizard. Um, <laughs> but here are some different options that you could possibly do with you using simple squares of whatever size you're choosing. Um, you could have younger grades use a six by six, older grades eight by eight or 10 by 10. Um, but if everybody has that similar shape, and even if they're different sizes, that can create your unity for pulling it all together in a bigger piece, whether they're physically attached or there's some space between them as they come together in a larger piece. So some different options um, could be about storytelling and narrative. So um, Carrie James Marshall in his works especially in this vignette series. Um, you could talk about Carrie James Marshall and storytelling and narrative. He also does comic book series where he's merging historical information with contemporary information. And there's also amazing um, videos showing his creative process on Art 21 for videos and information. Um, so Carrie James Marshall could be a really good uh, contemporary artists to use if you're looking to work with narratives and storytelling for all ages. Next slide. Thank you, Casey. If you were going the quilting route, um, one artist we decided to, to feature here and we've listed more in other places, Faith Ring Gold, because it's so, it works so well with younger students and older students alike with traditions and cultures and storytelling and bringing things together um, that obviously are very different, but again, that unifying shape or that unifying pattern um, brings that all together. And we'll share some more re references on if you wanted to use quilting as an inspiration for a project. Next slide. Thank you. El Anasui, one of my favorites, also an Art 21 artist um, from Ghana. He is a contemporary living artist today, and he's working with upcycled materials that hold a lot of meaning um, 
and cover a lot of different topics about culture and um, colonialism and trade and globalization and family. So depending on where you want to go and focus, he covers a lot of different topics. Again, lots of resources and videos on Art21's website. Um, if you're not familiar with Art21, Art21 is um, a PBS series that um, introduces us to contemporary artists, not just their work, but how they live and how they work in their space, how they collect their materials, how they think about their ideas, and kind of really covers the entire creative process that these various artists working with various media um, do. So it's a really great way to introduce students to various avenues for approaching art um, and even different interests, Sci um, artists inspired by history, artists inspired by science. And so you can find a lot of avenues to get students to say, oh my goodness, that famous artist looks like me. Oh my goodness, that famous artist is working on something that I'm interested in, like comic strips. Um, and oh my goodness, that artist is just talked about how they failed in this process miserably, but then how they used that experience to move forward. So lots of great resources there. Bob, thank you for putting that link in the chat. And just a, a quick little side note, Art21 Educators is a program for educators to collaborate and work together on curriculum building. Um, and I was in the cohort in 2019. Applications are open for cohort 10 this summer, 2021. If you want any information or want to apply, let me know. I cannot speak highly enough about it, but now I'm off topic. I got too excited. So El Anasui, <laughs> he's working with these reclaimed materials. He's also working with people in the community and hires a ton of people to come into his studio space and do this very repetitive work of um, putting all of these bottle caps or tin cans or um, I'm trying to think of all the different materials he uses, but they're, they're usually very kind of harsh, sharp materials. Like I don't, I don't want to go rub my hand down those little rings of metal, but from a distance, it looks like smooth, beautiful, shiny silk. And they're so gorgeous. Um, students love looking at his work. They love the size of it. They're huge installations, huge tapestries of metal and waste that have come together in a new purpose. And they're just beautiful. We There's um, one in the permanent collection in Kansas City. And then also they did a retrospective of his work in Des Moines a few years back. And students loved it so much that we took two or three caravans out to see it because they just wanted to go back. They love it. And Art21 has a great resources if you're wanting to look there about parts of a whole. So you could focus on how are you bringing all these little things together to make something big, or how can we upcycle things that were maybe a failure or a waste, and how can we come together as a community to make something big out of those? Um, we have bins and bins full of bottle caps. You know, how might we as a school do something creative with, with those in the community to upcycle those in a new and different way, not just simply copying and remaking an Ella Anasui piece, but how might we collect things and make something um, so that could be another big theme, parts of a whole, or this idea of upcycling and bringing things together as a community to reuse instead of um, waste. Next slide. So some resources here, if you were going the crafting route, we there's um, an interesting site here on the secret messages that were in quilts in order for people to communicate through the quilts. Um, so that one's really interesting. Um, there's many hands in service to community. I can't, honestly, I have to admit, I can't remember this one, the <laughs> quote crafted by many hands in service to the community. I'm blanking, um, but it had to do with pulling the community together. Um, this one I'm really interested in, centuries old tradition of military quilting. And the reason we included this one was because these are by men and we don't normally think of quilting as something that men do. So to get students maybe male students um, interested. Here's an entire series of men quilting. Um, and it also gets away from, helps us get away from this idea that these tasks are gender oriented, that, that everybody has done this in history. And here are some examples of that. So we included that for you. And painting from Spain's COVID-19 pandemic. Casey, can, I don't, hmm. 
Oh, was that, that was the link to our artist that we showed earlier, says, 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 um, where she's using, it's not as abstract and there, um, where she's using paintings and referencing objects that we recognize and maybe using symbolism. So just another artist that you could highlight that's working with the idea of COVID if you wanted to go that route of how are we feeling right now? What are we experiencing? You wanna tell your story? I wanna tell my story. Um, and kind of diving into how are we doing right now during this very bizarre time in our history. Next slide. Thank you. So some lesson options, um, again, you could do go with storytelling, how do students tell their story? Um, it could be their real story or this fiction of the of the future. What's it going to look like after the pandemic or how would how would um, how does the future world look? You could give a prompt. So it could be right now or the past or the or the future. Um, creating circular connections and what ways could students create a visual showing their understanding of learning from other content areas. So if they, for example, if I'm working with a science teacher and they're exploring cells um, and cells dividing, how could each student um, be assigned a different or choose a different type of cell um, and create some sort of work related to that that comes together to um, work with the science teacher on creating something bigger about what the meaning of that is or how it impacts our environment, our society, or our cultures. Um, and we also wanted to have a quick share out of ways in which you think that you might be able to utilize this in your community or multi-level schools where you could give some sort of prompt with a basic shape that can come together into something larger. Any other ideas we can share out? I actually wrote down from our presenters earlier, the Korean Bojagi, 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 <laughs> because that would actually work quite well for this. Um, so that was one idea I wrote down to add to my list. nothing in the okay well we're getting well, I, low just, on time. I, I think i love this idea of uh, you know we've been talking a lot of two-dimensional things but this idea of, of something three-dimensional you know I, I often think of like um tour to lincoln from many years ago or the hearts in lincoln where everybody kind of gets the same basic sculptural shape and then how does everybody tell their own story through that and then put those together because I, I think this concept of um kind of starting out with the same shape the same form and then how do people put that spin on it? It makes me think of shows like Chopped and those, right? Where they all start um, uh, with the same kind of tools, um, some parameters, and then how do we expand? I love that idea. Cause I think K through 12, you could do something beautiful with something sculptural. Yeah, and it, and it wouldn't necessarily have to hang just in the school. You could work with the public libraries or a local university, or you could even collaborate with students in a university class that do a certain part and then the high school students then mentor the younger students um, and there could be size differences, media differences. But if that shape is the same, you could put them together and say a log, I don't know all the different types of quilting, um, log, log cabin comes to mind <laughs> um, in, into this pattern where they're either mashed together or there are a few inches between each piece with a uh, background color, or maybe it becomes um, quilt patterns, but around a 3D form. Like what if it's a house or log cabin or dwelling type form that they're built around? That could be really interesting. Yeah, the possibilities I think are endless, aren't they? Hey, I'm, I've also worked with, uh, uh, I'm a good friends with an art teacher in Texas who um, in her town, she would go to, to um, different businesses where maybe the storefronts were empty or they were, had, the businesses had closed down and they would just see if they could post art in those storefronts. So what a great sculptural place or in places to put, which would add to the, you know, the, uh, the beauty of the town on those close, you know, unfortunately a sign of, of some towns, uh, those closed storefronts. 
Yeah. And we've done that here in Lincoln. When I was at a different school, um, Lincoln Lutheran uh, High School for a design course, we worked with businesses downtown and we did four different shops and had a competition and had it work with first Friday opening nights. And so the families were downtown. We invited them downtown for the art shows, but also to vote on the storefronts. Um, and we had a little more freedom being at a, a private school at that point in time with traveling and, and scheduling and stuff. But um, that was really cool for them. They they were really proud to be involved in the community and get to know some people and show off their design skills and connect it to a business and some local opportunities. Can we go to the next slide? Thanks, Casey. Uh, lesson options for materials. Again, this could be, this could work for anything. We're trying to keep it really open so that if you wanted to use this in your multi-level school, you could really adapt it in any way. Um, so you could use different materials with different grades, or maybe they all use the same materials, um, giving them an option on what they want to use. Um, and you could also create limitations as well. So this year we're talking a lot about how do, um, how do we work with creative constraints? meaning you've got some requirements and you've got some limitations because uh, this year we're limited, uh, but we still have requirements. And so I start them off with this fake project of, oh, you have this challenge to build a slide from the second floor art room to the entryway because this and what are your requirements and what are your limitations? And then how, how does having certain requirements or certain limitations on a project actually force you or support you in being more creative. And then we do a challenge with three crayons and a piece of paper. How are you limited? Oh gosh, so many ways. That list is soups long. Uh, but then how does this force it to be more creative? And the kids always surprise themselves. Oh, we could use the paper from the crayons and we could use a little bit of the wax to stick them together. And we, we don't have to keep it as one sheet. We could rip it apart and make it into 3d and, um, so it's been really helpful to think of creative constraints this year. And I could see how that could come into play here. What, what creative constraints would you place on certain grade levels or chunks um, to work on this? And again, what are some my other ideas that you might have or how does budget affect uh, this and what materials do you already have that you could use or how could kids bring in um, objects for nature or scraps from home to uh, paper bags, magazines uh, and work with collage. And since we're running low on time, do we have a, one more slide, Casey? Two more, one more, one. Okay. Um, and then size and shape. So we already kind of talked about this. You could do the history of different quilt patterns and assign a different quilt pattern to each group of the grade band or the combined grade bands um, or keep it basic with the same size and shape. Uh, you could also um, turn them like a diamond shape if you wanted. So lots of different options for that. And then also this idea of displaying them. It doesn't have to be the teacher assigning it and figuring it out, but maybe letting the kids pick what quilt pattern or what design and, or, um, and having a dip, maybe the older kids arranging it and composing it into that final piece. So we tried to keep it real open so that if you wanted to use this in the classroom, you could, but also just wanted you to have some time to make some art. Um, Cause <laughs> I know I personally, <laughs> I just, I either don't have the time or right now in all honesty, I'm just so sad. Like I can't, I'm just, I live alone. I'm obviously an extrovert. I'm pretty loud. I like people and I'm here. Um, and so this was really nice to have a be forced to, oh yeah, I can do this. This makes me feel better. <laughs> well, thank you to both you and Casey today. Um, just some really wonderful sharing. And these are things that, that people can go and use on Monday with their kids. I think you've just given us a nice breadth of uh, ideas and thoughts and we got to make art. Um, and Jen, I know you wanted people, if they're comfortable to go ahead and take snapshots of their art and put it in that folder. Uh, Jen, feel free to go ahead. I already copied it once and pasted, but if you wanna put that link in there again, it'd be wonderful to be able to kind of maybe share uh, some of the works that were created, if you're comfortable, only if you're comfortable, so. And we thought that we might be able to share out through the email list through NATA, what we do with them and some different options. So we're planning to, if you're willing to share, put those together in different ways and send that back out. Yeah. And you bring up a good point. If we do share those out, just know they're going to go out to, you know, potentially lots of different people. So only share if you're the most comfortable with that. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, we just appreciate you as, uh, 
educators that are willing to share as well as strong NATA leaders um, who just step up and, and support uh, art educators all over the state. And really, this morning all over the nation, which is exciting, very, very exciting. So thank you so much. Well, to end our workshop today, um, we're gonna welcome uh, Shelby Ricks, who is the NATA Advocacy Director. And Shelby is just going to share a little bit about advocacy this morning. So Shelby, you let me know when you're ready for me to go to your slide. I am ready, Bob. All right, let's do it. All right, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how you can advocate for your program, both inside and outside of your classroom. And I'm sure for a lot of you, you've started to realize that a lot of the advocacy work ends up being stuff that you do outside of your classroom. And so I made a list here of different ways that I thought about how anyone, no matter what state you were in, um, what your building setup was, that you could advocate for the programs that you have. And so the first ones I have up here are exhibiting students' work through uh, like art shows or exhibitions. Like I know we, we really work with Youth Art Month and I know every state does that, um, as well as other local shows. And social media is a big one. Um, I've seen a lot of people who have really put some neat ideas on social media. Um, I do caution people to make sure that you know what the privacy settings are for your state. Like, for example, I found out for um, our state, Nebraska, that um, if you uh, have a student who's awarded the state, those parents can't sign that uh photo disclosure. So please just make sure that you're doing that respectfully and thinking about those things as well. Um, and then one thing that I thought about a lot was being visible in your building and what that looks like. And I realized that, especially in a pandemic where so many things are going on, that idea of having one more thing is kind of nerve wracking. So I don't want you to feel like you need to just all of a sudden go out and be everywhere on your plan period. That's not what I mean. You need to find the advocacy pieces that work with uh, with where you are in your life. So for me, um, being visible in my building is a big one. Um, I am also uh, a faculty representative for our local education association or our teachers union. So I always try and go and talk to all of our new teachers there, um, as well as trying to be in conversations about logistics of how our building runs, um, or if they are, for example, we have in our school, I'm at the middle level, that um, students can get pulled for math interventions and what does that look like? Um, and so trying to make sure that I'm in those conversations and being involved is really, really important if you can, um, because I think just like all of us are realizing we are all coming from a different point um, in our view of education when we walk into those meetings. And so to have your voice heard of how this affects our kids, I think is really, really important. Um, and the third one I have on here is collaborating with others. So I don't know if a lot of people are like this, but um, I, I have an extra class typically. And I just decided one year, I just, I did not want to lose my sanity over having another extra class. And so I actually had a colleague who came in and she taught my extra class with me. And so we'd go over the curriculum. And what I found as she was teaching was that that became such an advocacy piece for my program because I had this teacher who was also in the building and she gave me the biggest compliment, which was, you know, teaching with you and seeing what you teach our kids has shown me more of what art education can be than what I ever thought possible, which was super cool. Um, so that inviting others in, um, that collaboration piece, I know one of our presenters said that she teaches art club with Spanish club, which is amazing, but that collaboration and inviting people in to see your process. And I think that's the other thing that we as art teachers don't always talk about um, when we're talking about how valid our program is, which is we are teaching kids, maybe not to all be studio artists, but to be problem solvers and critical thinkers. And, um, and that that's what we want to really showcase for people that, you know, not only can this person have this really great technique going, but here's what they can do with it and how they can think about that. And that's really important, I think, to get across to people. 
Um, so I already kind of mentioned the being involved in decision making in your building. And I know that that looks different depending on what school you're in or what your setup is. Um, joining organizations that can magnify your voice or have your interests. So, um, you know, I know, especially being in education and arts, we kind of feel like we're on our own island. So I think it's really important to have, you know, the communities like we have with our uh, Nebraska Art Teacher Association or your local, as well as, you know, the National Art Educator Association, feeling connected and finding people who, you know, can understand what you're going through and can really help you kind of figure out how to, you know, get your point across or to collaborate or work together. I think it's really important to not be alone in that advocacy piece, um, to find a group of people who you really connect with. And like I said earlier, I'm part of the um, local, the Lincoln Education Association, which I then, you know, have ties with the state and the um, federal, or sorry, national. And so that's also been helpful for me to see how they can give a voice for what's going on in education in that way as well. Um, because those other things like, you know, budgets and numbers and funding, all that stuff, does impact our programs. So I think it's really important to be thinking about those things too, as I'm sure a lot of us already do. Um, creating ties in your community is a big one. And they were things that I didn't actually think of directly. So it was, um, you know, me going into different like coffee shops and seeing that they didn't have any artwork on the walls or, you know, seeing all of these murals that are around town that made me think, oh, like this could be a really neat thing to collaborate. And there are so many organizations that when you reach out, um, they really do love working with you and in the community. And um, people are always willing to help out typically if you can ask them. Uh, I know for us, we have a, an organization in Lincoln called The Bay, which specifically works with youth in Lincoln, trying to give them a lot of different skills to um, help uh, kids, either it's a place to go or some life skills that they can use. And um, pre-pandemic, we were going to have this really great art show in our uh, city with different artworks from all around the city, which I thought was super cool. So there are a lot of different ties that you can find, and they don't necessarily, I think, have to be the ones that you automatically think of. Maybe not just the art centers, but those other businesses and things like that. Um, and then the one that I put on here last that um, I think a lot about, at least with where we are now, is to stay current on your state legislation if you can. Um, I know for us, our uh, state organization, our education association, puts out a newsletter um, once a week kind of telling us what's going on at um, our capital, um, what kind of things are in legislation. And that's really important so that you can figure out if you need to advocate in a different way outside your classroom, you know, who to contact. Maybe it's time to contact your governor through a letter, or maybe it's time to contact your state senator. Um, and then figuring out how you can get more involved with, you know, those other organizations and things that you can help get your voice out there and showing all those things that we are teaching kids how to do. Um, and they're all outside of the classroom, but they are all really important. So